All right, welcome back. So this time we're going to finish up the peripheral nervous system. Hopefully you'll remember that last time we talked about cranial nerves and that um, what made them cranial nerves was the fact that all 12 of those pairs originated from the brain or the brain stem with the possible exception of cranial nerve 11, which is the accessory nerve. But remember that in that case, uh, although that, those pairs or that pair did arise from the spinal cord, those fibers actually go back up through the foramen magnum and then exit the skull again. So that's what makes them uh, still count as cranial nerves. So now we're gonna move on to the spinal nerves. And so what distinguishes the spinal nerves from the cranial nerves is that the spinal nerves all originate from the spine as opposed to the brain or the brain stem. And so just like with the cranial nerves, there are pairs of them, except in this case, rather than 12 pairs, now we have 31 pairs. So there are quite a few more pairs of spinal nerves than there are of cranial nerves. Um, on the plus side though, they're named for their location and they're named consistently throughout the spinal cord as opposed to the cranial nerves. Remember that some of them are named for what they do, like the oculomotor nerve or where they are, like the hypoglossal nerve. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff with the spinal nerves. They're all named for their location and more specifically their location relative to a vertebrae. So as you can see there, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves and that includes eight pairs in the cervical section. So when I say pairs, so keep in mind I'm talking about that there is, uh, there's one on the left and one on the right and they're both at the same spinal level. So there's eight pair of cervical spinal nerves, there are 12 pair of thoracic spinal nerves, five pair in the lumbar section, five pair in the sacral section, and then one pair of tiny little cosageal nerves which are your, uh, your cossex membranes, your tailbone. So one of the things that you might have noticed there is that, so again, there's eight spinal nerves in the cranial, or sorry, in the cervical section, but there's only seven cervical vertebrae. So how does that work? So the way that it works in the cervical section is the C1 uh, spinal nerve actually runs above the atlas, which is the C1 vertebrae. The C2 spinal nerves run above the C2 vertebrae, which is the axis. And then we go all the way down to uh, C7. So there's a C1 pair of spinal nerves that run above C7, and then the C8 pair actually run underneath C7. And then throughout the thoracic and lumbar sections, each of the spinal nerves is named for the vertebrae above them. So for example, the T1 spinal nerves um, are underneath or run underneath the T1 vertebrae. And I'll show you a picture of that here in a couple minutes. So that's the way those are named. So each of those, each of the pairs are named for the vertebrae that runs either uh, below them or above them. So looking at the spinal nerves a little bit more closely, each of the nerves of the spinal nerves is actually formed from um, two roots. So there's a dorsal root and a ventral root, and both of those two merge together to form a spinal nerve. So remember that the, uh, the dorsum of the body or the dorsal aspect is the posterior aspect or the back of the body. The ventral aspect is the anterior or the front part of the body. So the two roots then, and I'm actually going to click ahead to the next slide to show you what those look like. So what you're looking at here, so this is your spinal cord, and then this is actually a lumbar vertebrae, but that's okay. So here's a lumbar vertebrae. Um, underneath this is our pedicle, and then here's part of the lamina that's been cut, you can see. So there is a uh, ventral root here and then a dorsal root here, and so those two then merge together to form the spinal nerve. And you can see that a little bit better over here because it's actually labeled on the left side of the diagram. So here's your spinal nerve, and again, here's your ventral root, and then here is your dorsal root on the back side. The important thing to know about those two um, in terms of the roots is that the ventral root, so the one on the anterior aspect, carries motor information. So all of your motor output runs out the front side of the spinal cord, runs through the anterior aspect of the spinal cord and out those ventral roots. All of your sensory information travels up the posterior aspect, so through these dorsal roots into the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. So one of the things I want you to know is that motor information goes out the front, goes out the anterior aspect of the spinal cord into that ventral root, and then sensory information comes in the back. Um, so in that dorsal aspect or on the posterior aspect um, of both the root and the spinal cord. So motor goes out the front, sensory information comes in the back. Um, 
So to tie that into some of the stuff we've talked about in the past, so remember thinking back to chapter nine, when we talked about muscles, we talked about the concept of a motor unit. And remember that a motor unit is an alpha motor neuron, one of them, and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. And so one of the things that I kept talking about with the alpha motor neurons is that they live in the uh, ventral horn of the spinal cord. So their bodies sit, those cell bodies sit in this gray matter here, and then their axons run out the ventral root and then into that spinal nerve and then out from that. So that's the way that works. Um, so while I'm at it, talking about dorsal and ventral roots, there's a little structure here, there's a little bump. Um, and you can see that's called the dorsal root ganglion. So remember that a ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. And so what those are, those are the cell bodies of your afferent or your sensory neurons. And so effectively, remember that when we talked about the uh, sensory receptors like the Pacinian corpuscles um, and the Ruffini endings and all of that stuff, I talked about those, those receptors being effectively modified dendrites. And so what you've got is the receptors are you know, out here somewhere in the body and then they relay that sensory information up that modified dendrite all the way back here to the cell body of the sensory neuron and then we go out the axon. So there's just a really, uh, the sensory neurons then have really, really long um, dendrites is kind of a way to think about them. Um, and then again, cell body here, axon here. All right, so again, dorsal ventral roots merge to form your spinal nerve and then the spinal nerve naturally is going to split because why wouldn't it? <laughs> so it's going to split um, as you can see into dorsal and ventral rami. So rami is plural, a ramus is singular. So the dorsal ramus goes toward the back, the ventral ramus goes toward the front. And so the difference between the two is obviously what they innervate. And so you get a better view here on the bottom in this cross-sectional view. So you can see that the dorsal ramus actually runs back here. In this case, it's innervating the erector spinae group. Um, but the, the uh, axons that run out via the dorsal ramus, or in, depending on which set we're talking about, through the dorsal ramus, are going to innervate the posterior aspect of the trunk. So, and you can see that here, because again, they're innervating the muscles of the erector spinae group. So the uh, axons, again, that run out the dorsal root, innervate the posterior aspect of the body. The ventral root um, axons innervate everything else. So that includes all the musculature on the lateral aspect of the truck, or trunk, sorry, uh, the anterior aspect of the trunk, and then also the limbs. So we're gonna run from this ventral ramus here, uh, then those are actually going to merge together into what are called plexuses. And so, for example, you'll have this ventral ramus from this spinal nerve will run into this one, they'll merge together, and then that'll, um, along with several others from levels above or below, will form what's called a plexus. And there are four major plexuses. We're actually only gonna talk about uh, one of them in any level of depth, but the four major plexuses are the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, so the brachial plexus goes to your arm, the lumbar plexus, which largely innervates your legs, um, and then the sacral plexus. So the plexuses then, cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral. Um, and again, a thing to know is that the plexuses are only formed by interlacing networks from the ventral rami. All right, so I have a little case study for you building off of that complicated sounding information. And so the case study is we're going to pretend that you are a football coach, say a high school football coach. So one of your players makes a tackle in which his head gets knocked to, we're going to say, his left side. So his head gets knocked toward his, his left side. On the opposite side, so on the right, where his neck was stretched, he complains of a burning pain and numbness in his hand. You notice that his arm is sort of dangling by his side and that he's not running with it as he normally would. And so basically what's going to happen is he's going to come running off of the field um, and he is going to complain to you that he's got tingling and numbness in his arm. He may say something like his arm is on fire and, and that he can't move it. Um, and so he's obviously going to be very concerned about this. And this low resolution picture, the reason that I picked it, so this tackler here, um, this is obviously a college game, but this tackler's head's getting knocked to the side. It's going to depress his right shoulder. And so that's the type of um, mechanism that might lead to this particular injury. So what might have happened that our athlete 
has tingling and burnus, bur sorry, tingling and burning in his right arm, and then um, decreased strength at the very least, or potentially an inability to move his right arm. What might have happened? And so the answer to that question is that he has stretched the bundle of nerves that innervates his right arm. He has stretched the brachial plexus. And so you can see here, this is, is the right side, the right arm that you're looking at, and this is a picture of the brachial plexus. And so what happens there is whenever his head gets knocked toward the left side, it is going to stretch out all of these nerves, these bundles of axons, which then is going to temporarily change their function. So remember that the way that nerves function is that they uh, function on an electrochemical gradient, that they at rest have a lot of sodium outside of them, a lot of potassium inside of them, and then to generate electrical signals, they allow those two to switch places. Well, if we mechanically stretch an axon, we interfere with the normal functioning of those voltage-gated, in particular, uh, channels. And so what that's going to do is it's going to allow an influx of sodium into the neuron, an efflux of potassium, so potassium moves out. And so because of that flux, you're going to get nerve firing when there shouldn't be, or other nerves that are not able to fire when they should. And so the brain interprets that information as uh, as tingling or a lack of sensation. So that's the sensory aspect to it. From a motor standpoint, when you stretch those axons, those neurons then are not able to conduct their signal all the way out to the muscles that they innervate. And so then that becomes manifest as either weakness or paralysis. They simply can't move those muscles because they can't get the electrical signal out from the brain to those muscles telling them to contract. And so the particular type of injury, this is more colloquially known, more colloquially known as a stinger or burner, but the actual name of the injury is a brachial plexus neuropraxia. So there's, it's kind of like um, we talked about degrees of um, strains or sprains where there's a, a one, two, and three. Very similar concept here. So a neuropraxia is essentially like a grade one um, stretching or compression of a neuron. And so here what you've got is there's no actual structural damage to the neuron. And so typically within you know, five to 10 minutes, sometimes a little bit less, um, those neurons will be able to restore their normal um, resting gradients. And so when they're able to do that, then they're able to send electrical signals again. And so then you get the return of normal sensation and then the return of normal strength. If, they, if the athlete um, had a little bit more um, severe injury, so if they actually stretched the axons even more and, and uh, partially tore them, typically what, what actually tears is the endoneurium, which hopefully you'll remember is the layer of connective tissue that wraps around an individual axon. And so with that, um, because some of the endoneurium is still usually intact, um, that's the type of injury that may be symptomatic for a few days, potentially a week or two. Um, but because some of that connective tissue layer is still intact, that nerve can repair itself. So usually the symptoms subside, but it, it takes a little bit longer amount of time. It's not just uh, a matter of, of pumping ions to one side of the membrane or the other. And then, um, so that's called an axonotmesis. And then a grade three, if you will, uh, is effectively a rupture of the entire nerve, potentially, or of the, at the very least, a rupture of an axon. So that's called a neurotmesis. So it's a rupture of the axon, as well as the endoneurium, and potentially perineurium and epineurium. And so then that, that uh, severity of injury makes regeneration impossible, and so they will lose function uh, in the muscles innervated by that particular nerve. Those are pretty rare. Uh, typically, uh, what you see in, in uh, sporting context are more the neuropraxy, where they have tingling and numbness for a few minutes, and then uh, once you get them to calm down and sit down for a few minutes, they, they uh, again, sensory function returns and motor function returns back to normal. Um, but they can return to play after that if you want to put them back in the game, but you do need to make sure that they uh, have normal sensation and at least 80% strength on the affected side. So if they, in this case, the guy hurt his right arm. So you'd want to make sure that he was at least 80% as strong on the injured side as the uninjured side. All right. So speaking of plexuses, so that was, again, an injury to the brachial plexus. Um, and that's probably the one you'll hear the most about. Occasionally, you may hear something about the lumbar plexus. Um, but most commonly, you'll hear things about the brachial plexus. So um, the way that plexuses work, so remember that the ventral rami um, are going to merge together. And so for example, so the brachial plexus is actually C5 through T1. And so the nerves, spinal nerves coming off of C5 are going to merge together with C6. And so when those two levels merge together, 
then that's going to form a trunk. And in the case of the brachial plexus, there are three trunks. There's an upper trunk, which you see here. There's a middle trunk, which is actually only the C7 uh, nerve, spinal nerve. And then there's a lower trunk here, which is C8 and T1. So again, the brachial plexus is C5 down to T1. So once we've merged into trunks, then they're going to uh, split again into divisions. And so you can see there's an anterior division. So those are here in yellow. And then there's a posterior division here in green. Um, effectively, what happens with the divisions is the anterior divisions innervate uh, the skin and muscles of the anterior aspect of the arm. Posterior divisions innervate the skin and muscles on the posterior aspect of the arm. Um, and then we get some splitting after that. So we, even after we've split into uh, anterior and posterior divisions, um, so then we split into cords. So there are three cords in the case of the brachial plexus. So there's a lateral cord, which is here, and then there's a posterior cord here, and a medial cord here, so three cords. And the naming of the cords is relative to their position relative to the brachial artery. So the brachial artery is on the medial aspect of your arm. It's actually just behind your biceps. You can find a pulse there pretty easily. Um, and so the cords are named for, again, their position relative to that brachial artery. And so off of the cords, the nerves will split again, or the axons will split again, it's probably a better way of putting that, into the uh, named nerves. So then we get into the named nerves of the forearm. So you got the muscul musculocutaneous nerve, radial nerve, median nerve, ulnar nerve, and then the axillary nerve as well. So this is just a, a different depiction of the same thing. So um, again, without the, without the actual color coding, um, where we're going to go from C5 into the upper trunk to the anterior division, the lateral cord, and the musculocutaneous nerve. So, one of the things I forgot to mention a little bit earlier was that um, all of the spinal nerves are mixed nerves. It was in, it was written on the slideshow, but just in case you missed it. So all the spinal nerves are mixed nerves. And so all of these nerves are mixed nerves as well. So remember that with some of the cranial nerves, that some of them were either only afferent, so only sensory. So for example, the optic nerve or the olfactory nerve, both of those are either are only afferent, only sensory nerves. Or you have other nerves in the cranial uh, among the cranial nerves that are only motor. So for example, the oculomotor is, only has motor function, so it's only efferent. But then some others, like the vagus nerve, are mixed nerves. Well, in this case, so all of your spinal nerves are mixed nerves. They all have sensory function and they all have motor function. And so, for example, with the musculocutaneous nerve, the sensory function for it is, is the lateral forearm, kind of this area here. And then it also, from a motor standpoint, innervates the coracobrachialis muscle, the biceps muscle, and then the brachialis muscle as well. So if we damage that nerve, that would present then with sensory deficits they can't feel out here, and then also that they would have some weakness um, in, the, in elbow flexion and also in shoulder flexion between um, problems stimulating the biceps as well as coracobrachialis and then brachialis. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about dermatomes. So from a definitional standpoint, a dermatome is an area of skin innervated by the cutaneous branch of a single spinal nerve. So um, basically it's an area of skin innervated by one particular spinal nerve, as you can see there. So um, this guy, you can see that he has uh, areas of skin that start with C2 all the way down through uh, the sacral section, right? Um, one of the things you probably noticed is that there's, there's no color coding on his face. And so, of course, you remember from last time's lecture that the reason for that is that sensory uh, sensation from the face comes from the cranial or from cranial nerve 5, which is the trigeminal nerve. So that's why his face isn't part of the color coding here. And so all of the spinal nerves, except for C1, innervate dermatomes. So from a practical standpoint, what that means then is that if we have damage to, let's say, the C6 spinal nerve, then we're going to have uh, the inability to feel this lateral aspect of the forearm. Um, and so how that, how that ties into what we were just talking about with uh, the named nerves of the forearm. So there's some overlap here. So this area of the forearm, again, the sensory innervation for that is the musculocutaneous nerve. So that sensory information travels from whichever sensory receptor in the forearm to the musculocutaneous nerve, from there to the lateral cord of the anterior division, then to the upper trunk, and then back into the C6 
spinal nerve. So back into this level of the spinal cord, and then the information travels up the cord to the thalamus and then to the somatosensory cortex. So I mentioned uh, earlier about the 31 pairs of spinal nerves and that in the cervical section, um, the spinal nerve actually runs above the vertebrae. So here is a depiction. So here's your C1 vertebrae. Here's the C1 spinal nerve running above it, C2 on down. And then remember that there are eight spinal nerves in the cervical section, but only seven cervical vertebrae. And so your C8 spinal nerve actually runs underneath C7. And then here's our first thoracic vertebrae, T1. And so here's the T1 spinal nerve, T2, T2 spinal nerve on down, right? So same concept in the lumbar section, same concept in the uh, sacral section. One of the things, just as an FYI, um, so this is the, um, the most common dermatome map you'll see in different textbooks, but they do vary a little bit. Um, so you'll see if you, if you use different textbooks, there will be a slightly different dermatome map than this. Um, and they do vary a little bit person to person. And one of the other caveats is that the, the lines aren't quite this clean. Um, so in all of us, it's not like C5 stops right here and T1 starts right there. Um, there's some overlap between the two of them. So it's not exactly that clean, but they're in that general area. All right, so dermatomes are areas of skin innervated by a particular spinal nerve. Myotomes then are groups of muscles innervated by a particular spinal nerve. So I mentioned that the brachial plexus includes C5 down to T1. And so um, you can see that C5 is responsible for the muscles that produce shoulder abduction, so primarily the deltoid. The C6 spinal nerve is responsible for the muscles that produce elbow flexion and wrist extension, and then on down there. So the athlete that I gave you in the case study who had a, a stinger or burner, um, again, if his head was knocked to the left side, probably had symptoms on the right side, and so he could return to play. But what I would do before I let him go back to play is make sure his shoulder abduction strength is basically the same on the right side as the left. Check elbow flexion, uh, elbow extension, wrist motion, and then finger motion. And again, if he is almost as strong in the injured side as the uninjured side, then he can return to play that same day. Um, and then, so this is the lumbar plexus here. Um, so starting with L2, so L2 innervates the muscles of hip flexion. L3, you can see, is knee extension. Four, dorsiflexion. Five is your big toe extension. Um, and then once you get into the sacral section, S1 is responsible for plantar flexion and eversion. S2, plantar flexion, knee flexion, and then uh, hip extension. So why all that matters and why I mentioned that, um, that comes into play whenever you've got things like uh, bulging discs. So what you've got here is it's a... Uh, a decent depiction of a bulging disc. So this is a, a cross-sectional view, a transverse view of the lumbar spine in this case. So what you're looking at here, this is a, an intervertebral disc. And so remember, this is the annulus fibrosus, that outer fibrocartilage portion. Here's the nucleus pulposus, that inner um, jelly-like material that is primarily water. And so a really common mechanism of injury that happens here is basically with prolonged posture, so especially in flexion. So if you, if you sit with the lumbar spine with your low back flexed, what that does is it puts a lot of pressure on the anterior part of the disc. So it compresses the anterior part of the disc and pushes that nuclear material posteriorly. Remember that we have a uh, longitudinal ligament here. So the spinal cord itself is protected, but what ends up happening is the disc ends up um, that that creep that we've talked about where you have a, a low intensity, long duration stretch, or in this case, yeah, we'll stick with that. So low intensity, long duration stretch, we're gonna start to stretch out this fibrocartilage on the posterior lateral aspect of the disc, specifically the annulus. And so then whenever we flex the spine and we start to compress that anterior aspect, it's gonna push that nuclear material posterior laterally. Well, again, your spinal nerve sits right there, and so whenever we push that nuclear material posterior laterally, it's gonna compress that spinal nerve, which then keeps motor signals from getting out, but also keeps sensory signals from getting back in. So the effect is that they're gonna have numbness along that dermatome because sensory information is gonna be coming back, but it can't get to the cord, because of that mechanical compression. And similarly, motor information can't get out away from the cord because of that compression there at the spinal nerve. Um, so for example, let's say somebody has a 
Let's go with this. So they've got uh, an L4, L5 disc herniation. Um, so bulging disc there. And so what ends up happening is you usually compress the bottom of those two spinal nerves. So if it's the L4, L5 disc, typically the L5 um, spinal nerve is affected. And so the person who had that condition would probably report to you that they had tingling or numbness along the L5 dermatome. Of course, they're not going to say it that way. They're going to tell you that the lateral aspect of their leg gets numb sometimes or they have tingling there or tingling across the top of the foot. But in addition to that, so remember that these are all mixed nerves. So not only are they going to have some sensory dysfunction there, but they're also going to have motor dysfunction. So, and remember that the myotome for L5 is big toe extension. And so they're going to have some weakness in extension of their big toe. So they may have some, uh, even some gait alteration because of that um, bulging disc issue. Similarly, um, as we age, I think the stats, something like 80% uh, of us are eventually going to have some kind of low back problem. Um, and so one of the things that plays a role in that, remember we've talked about that your disc height decreases with age, so the, the nucleus is less well able, or less able to rehydrate itself overnight. And so as those discs lose height, then that closes down this intervertebral foramen. And so your spinal nerves sit there in that intervertebral foramen. So in addition to losing disc height, which results in a closing down of the intervertebral frame. And we also tend to get um, just bony outgrowths that are called osteophytes, or more colloquially known as bone spurs, that uh, impinge on or close down that intervertebral frame. And so you can see down here, so this is supposed to be L4, L5. And so this little osteophyte poking posteriorly off of L4, this one poking posteriorly off of L5. And so that has really closed down the space in this intervertebral foramen in that L4, L5 space as opposed to way up here at the top of the lumbar section where it's not affected, you can see that intervertebral frame is nice and open. And so because of that combination of loss of disc height plus osteophytes, you typically get some interference with those spinal nerves and then that produces those classic sensations of um, tingling and numbness and then probably some weakness, um, although they may or may not overtly complain of weakness. So that's why um, the dermatomes and the myotomes matter. The other reason for that is, is um, we check those after um, like potential head and neck injuries. So you'll see sometimes an athlete, you know, a football player makes a head down tackle on the field. And so you'll see um, sometimes if they don't cut away from it for a commercial break, you'll see the uh, athletic trainers or the physicians doing grip testing on the athlete. And so what they're doing is they're checking myotomes, they're checking strength and making sure that they're, that it's, they have some uh, control of the musculature, but they're also checking strength bilaterally. Um, and then they'll also do an assessment for sensation, making sure that they can feel different parts of their, uh, their arm. And so they're, again, checking dermatomes, checking myotomes, because with a spinal cord injury, what you're going to have um, is, so an actual injury to the cord is going to produce symptoms on both sides. And so they'll have weakness on both sides or paralysis potentially on both sides, and then they'll also have um, numbness or uh, tingling on both sides. So that's one of the ways that, that we can actually differentiate between an injury to a spinal nerve which is unilateral, it's one-sided, versus an injury to the spinal cord is bilateral or both sides. All right, so let's talk about reflexes. So there's two broad types of reflexes, um, intrinsic or acquired. So intrinsic reflexes are ones that are uh, pre-programmed, if you will. So those are, those are the ones that you're born with. Um, so the classic example there is the pain withdrawal reflex. So if you touch a hot stove, you're going to pull your hand back right after doing that without even thinking about it. It's a protective reflex. So that's an intrinsic reflex. It's just something that we do. Um, as opposed to an acquired reflex, if you acquire something, you get it. So an acquired reflex is one that we've developed. Um, and so most of your athletes, um, or at least have been athletes at some point in your life, so a lot of the acquired reflexes, a lot of the things that you do as part of your sporting movements are actually acquired reflexes. So uh, the throwing motion, the serving motion in volleyball, um, those types of things, just in the weight room, your, your squat form um, is to some extent an acquired reflex. How far down you go is typically pretty consistent. Um, and so that would then fall into the category of an acquired reflex. So in terms of reflexes, um, they are, especially the intrinsic ones, they are involuntary. So they're, again, they can be thought of just as a motor program that kind of runs itself. You touch a hot stove, you're going to pull your hand back. It's just a, a motor program that, that happens on its own. 
So now that said, I should qualify that by saying that um, we can override that or we can mediate them with conscious information. So for example, if you were holding like a, a um, pot of boiling water, um, you would your reflex would be to drop it or to throw it, something like that, to get it away from you, right? Uh, but if you've got, say, a small child next to you, you're not going to do that. Um, so you can override that reflex because um, obviously you wouldn't want to hurt the, the small child. Um, so the components to reflexes then, so the first thing, we have to receive that sensory information. So the first thing there is a receptor. And so what this diagram is depicting is somebody being poked by a needle, something sharp. And so we're going to say that this receptor here, we're going to pretend that this is a free nerve ending. And so that um, damage to the tissue is going to cause depolarization of, a, of our free nerve ending. It's going to send an action potential up the spinal cord. Right, and so that's our sensory neuron. So that would be one of those A delta fibers that we talked about last time. Um, and so that information from our free nerve ending is going to travel up an A delta fiber up to the spinal cord. And again, remember the sensory information comes in the back side of the cord. That uh, A delta fiber is going to synapse with an interneuron. And it would also synapse with a, a second order afferent that's going to bring the information up the spinal cord so that the brain could process the information. But from a reflex standpoint, we, we synapse with an interneuron, um, which is uh, the book here is calling that the integration center. And then the interneuron synapses with a motor neuron, an alpha motor neuron, which then will uh, generate an action potential going out to the muscle, oops, causing it to contract. So the muscle is the effector, uh, and so it's going to contract to, to uh, we're going to pretend this is on our finger, so it's going to contract the flexor muscles of the forearm and wrist to pull our hand away from whatever sharp thing poked us. Um, and so we'll talk about those as they relate to uh, muscle spindles here in a second and then the stretch reflex in muscles because those are really important for a variety of things from walking and running to a lot of the sport movements that we perform. Um, in terms of somatic versus autonomic reflexes, so the example I just gave you there, um, that pain withdrawal reflex is a somatic reflex because it innervates or it activates, is a better way of saying that, activates skeletal muscle. Um, as opposed to autonomic reflexes, so remember your autonomic nervous system controls things like your heart rate, your breathing rate, glands, etc. So autonomic reflexes um, activate, rather than skeletal muscle, smooth muscle or cardiac muscle or glands. Um, so an example of an autonomic reflex would be um, one of the things we talked about last time um, where we're checking cranial nerves. If you take a pin light and put it in front of somebody's eye, you're going to see that their pupil is going to constrict to limit the amount of light that gets in, inside the eye. Um, and so that's an autonomic reflex. It's one you don't, you don't have to think about, but again, it's going to, in that case, innervate a smooth muscle to produce constriction of the uh, eye. Um, or people, constriction of the people is a better way of saying that. All right, so speaking of stress reflexes, <clears throat> so muscle spindles I touched on a little bit briefly, but we're going to expand on them now. So a few things to know about muscle spindles. So muscle spindles are essentially special types of muscle fibers, and so they sit right in along with the rest of the muscle fibers. So these are, are very similar to the, the normal muscle cells that we talked about but they have some, uh, a few extra features, if you will. So muscle spindles are referred to as intrafusal fibers, and the reason they're intrafusal, so anything intra is inside of. So in the case of muscle spindles, they're inside of a connective tissue capsule, which is depicted here. So that's the connective tissue capsule, so they're intrafusal fibers because they're inside of a connective tissue capsule. As opposed to extrafusal fibers are all the types of muscle fibers we've been talking about um, so far throughout the course, those are just your normal, regular muscle, skeletal muscle fibers. Those are all extrafusal fibers. So don't let the, the intrafusal, extrafusal confuse you. Muscle spindles and, and intrafusal fibers are the same thing, and then extrafusal fibers are just regular muscle fibers. So inside of that capsule, we have a couple different types of sensory fibers. So these are your uh, little muscle cells here inside of the muscle spindle. And so they do have a non-contractile component here in the middle of these special fibers, um, of these intrafusal fibers. So there's a non-contractile component here. And then you can see that there are uh, two types of sensory fibers that innervate them. So we've got our 
annular spiral endings, which are uh, shown here in blue. And so those wrap around that middle or non-contractile portion of the muscle spindles. And then we've got our flower spray endings pictured here in purple. And so those um, are attached to the contractile portions of the muscle spindles. So um, the reason the, the difference matters, so the annulospiral endings that are around that central portion, which is usually a little bit thicker, has a, has a larger cross-sectional uh, area or a larger, larger diameter on the fiber, um, the annulospiral in, uh, endings detect when the muscle changes length, uh, but also, so they detect um, degree of stretch is another way of putting that. Uh, but in addition to detecting how stretched or not the muscle is, they also detect rate of stretch. So remember we talked about um, phasic versus tonic receptors. So phasic receptors detect change and also rate of change versus tonic receptors detect um, continuous position. So in the case of the annulospiral endings, they really are effective at detecting rate of change. So is the muscle being stretched and how fast? As opposed to the flower spray endings here detect more of that tonic position. So um, they detect primarily degree of stretch. So is the muscle stretched or not? That's basically the information that they give. So the flower spray endings then don't give information about um, rate of change of whenever the muscle is actually changing length. So if the muscle is, is uh, shortening or lengthening, the flower spray endings don't really have anything to say about that. It's the annulospiral endings that provide that information. So there's another term on here that you haven't seen before, which is gamma efferents. So remember the efferents are motor fibers. Also remember that we just talked about alpha motor neurons that innervate voluntary skeletal muscle. The gamma efferents activate these contractile portions on either end of the muscle spindle fibers. Um, and so the gamma motor neurons or the gamma efferents then are gonna cause contraction of the muscle spindles. And so why does that matter? It matters because um, if the rest of the muscle contracts, but the muscle spindle doesn't, which is what this is going to look like. So if the rest of the muscle contracts, but the muscle spindle doesn't, it's going to put a lot of slack in the muscle spindle. And so that doesn't make, uh, that basically keeps us from being able to detect a change in muscle length. So the muscle spindles have to be able to keep up with the extrafusal, the regular fibers, and they do that by having their own alpha, mo or sorry, their own motor neurons, gamma motor neurons, that uh, cause their contractile endings to shorten. And so what we can do, um, if we're in unstable environments, we can do something called gamma biasing. Uh, and so basically what that is, is that you actually pre-shorten your muscle spindles. So let's say you are, um, I don't know, in the training room playing around on one of the AirX pads, one of the little blue squishy pads, and you're working on your balance. And so what you're going to do is you're actually going to engage in gamma biasing of the, mus uh, the musculature of the lower leg, of the thigh, and of the hip. And so what you're going to do is actually pre-shorten those muscle spindles a little bit so they're really sensitive to any minor change so that I can react quickly and correct. So if I start to, you know, invert my ankle, we can react a little bit faster by pre-stretching those muscle spindles. Uh, and then we can activate our perineal musculature and, and go back to being in a nice neutral position and hopefully avoid an injury or hopefully avoid falling off of that uh, AirX pad. So... Remember that the way that the nervous system codes the intensity of a stimulus is based on the frequency of a signal. And so what you've got here um, is how detection of muscle stretch works. So you've got your muscle spindles here, uh, your annular spiral endings here. And so if the muscle is just stretched a little bit, then they're gonna send, as well as the flower spray endings, just a few signals every second. So that's what this is showing here. And then if we stretch the muscle really quickly, then we're gonna get faster signals, so greater frequency of action potentials. That indicates that the muscle is being stretched and also how fast it's being stretched. So the faster the muscle stretched, uh, the, the greater the frequency of depolarization of those afferent fibers or those, those afferent neurons. So why, where does any of this stuff matter? Um, this stuff matters if you, um, it kind of it, it lets us uh, set an expectation for muscle stretch or not. So, for example, if you're out uh, walking the dog, right? So, if you're out walking the dog, he's on a, he's on a leash. You probably have your elbow flexed a little bit. Maybe you you know you look the other direction, and at the same time that you look away, the dog sees a squirrel or something, and so he takes off. 
And so what you're going to get is, as he takes off, it's going to pull your arms straight. So it's going to stretch your biceps muscles. It's going to stretch your brachialis muscles. And so you would know that the dog has taken off without even seeing it from the stretch in your arm. So you're going to get feedback from the muscle spindles and the biceps and the brachialis that then go back to uh, the spinal cord. And you're actually going to get a reflex contraction. You're going to reflexively contract your elbow. And then because of that unexpected muscle stretch, you're probably then going to turn your head to look and see what the dog is doing um, so that you can get some, some conscious sensory information about it as well. Um, and so it, it kind of allows us to um, sort of preset our expectation of um, muscle length, but also rate of change of that length. So, for example, when we talked about motor unit recruitment, I remember one of the examples I gave of the way the motor unit recruitment worked is, is so... You start with your type 1 fibers, the smallest fibers, work up to type 2 A's, and then eventually up to 2 X's. And the example I gave was that if you uh, are helping somebody move, and they ask you to move a closed box, and they tell you that it contains pillows. So you go and you put a little bit of force into it and try to pick it up, but it turns out that that box is actually much heavier than you anticipated. It turns out that box has textbooks in it rather than pillows. So your expectation, whenever you went to go lift the box up and you recruited your type 1 fibers, was that there would be some shortening of those fibers. But then there wasn't. And so you knew that through the uh, lack of change in, in the stretch, or shortening in this case, of the muscle spindles. And so because there was a difference between your expectation, you were expecting a shortening of the musculature and it didn't happen, then that causes you to recruit your type 2 A's and then again up to the type 2 X's if you need them in order to move that box. So an important thing to know about the muscle spindles is that they cause a reflex contraction. So if the muscles are stretched really quickly, the, sig the signal that results is, so they're going to send a signal back to the spinal cord, which is what's shown here. So they're going to send a signal back to the spinal cord indicating that the muscle is being stretched really quickly. And then that is going to, again, synapse with an alpha motor neuron that causes reflex contraction of the muscle. So when muscle spindles are stimulated, they cause reflex contraction. It's an excitatory response causing the muscle to contract or shorten. So the classic example of that is what happens when you go to the doctor's office during a physical. They'll do the patellar tendon reflex. And so when they tap on your patellar tendon, that is going to put a slight stretch in your quadriceps group, which then is picked up by those muscle spindles. Again, so in the quads. And again, they'll send a, a sensory signal back to the cord, synapses with an inner neuron, but also a motor neuron, causes reflex contraction of the quad group to try to protect the muscle. So basically, um, a way to view the muscle spindles is that from a protective standpoint, they try to keep the muscle from being overstretched. So they, they cause it to contract to prevent that overstretching that could potentially damage the muscle. Um, but they also do things like keep you from falling down. So for example, if, if you, um, you know, jump off a box and land on the ground, you're going to get a, a rapid lengthening of the quad group. You're going to get a re reflex contraction of the quad group to keep you from falling on your face. So they, they're also protective in that sense. Um, but in addition to getting that excitatory signal causing the quad group to contract, you're also going to get what's referred to as reciprocal inhibition. And so reciprocal inhibition is going to mean that we keep the antagonist muscle group from firing. So at the same time that I am contracting my quads to keep them from being overstretched, I'm going to inactivate the hamstrings because those are knee flexors. So I don't want them, to, I don't want the quads to have to fight against the hamstrings as well as whatever that external force is. So we're going to reflexively inhibit the antagonist muscle group. So that's called reciprocal inhibition. I think we already covered all that. Yep, so we're good there. All right. So Golgi tendon organs, touched on these two times ago. Um, but again, these are sensory organs inside of, um, or sensory fibers, not organs, but sensory fibers inside of the tendon of a muscle. And so remember that these special, again, modified dendrites essentially wrap around the collagen fibers that form the tendon. And so whenever the tendon is stretched, that's going to compress the Golgi tendon organs, and that's then going to cause them to uh, send an action potential back to the spinal cord. An important thing to know about Golgi tendon organs, though, they are also protective, um, just like the muscle spindles are, except that the Golgi tendon organs are going to cause reflex inhibition. So whenever the Golgi tendon organs are activated, 
they actually inhibit or shut off the alpha motor neuron and they cause the muscle to reflexively relax. So whereas muscle spindles cause contraction, Golgi tendon organs cause relaxation. And so the technical term for that is autogenic inhibition, which means that we're inhibiting the muscle, we're keeping it from contracting. And specifically we do that by preventing the alpha motor neuron from firing. Where might you have seen that? Um, if you've ever watched anybody max out in the weight room, so it, it, most commonly this happens on like bench press. So if you see somebody, you know, take the bar out of the rack, go down to their chest, come about halfway up on bench press and they get stuck. And if you just kind of watch them, <laughs> just leave them there, say they're on the spotter, um, leave them there for a second or two, they're gonna keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. And then eventually it's gonna look like their arms just give out, like the bar just drops. And so what has happened there is they've generated so much tension in the muscle that they have caused that reflexive uh, inhibition of, of the muscle. They've activated their Golgi tendon organs, so that caused reflex relaxation, and so then the bar just drops as they relax their pecs and their tricep musculature. So um, you also see that, so I mentioned box jumps a minute ago or jumping off of something. So if you're doing plyometrics, so if you jump off, you know, let's say, a, I don't know, a 12-inch box, hit the ground, jump up onto a 20-inch box or something like that. So that's normally, you know, no problem for, for most athletes. But uh, if you, rather than jumping off a 12-inch box, you jump off of a 36-inch box. So you're jumping from a pretty, pretty big height. So whenever you hit the ground off of that three-foot box, your quads are going to have to generate quite a bit of force, and it may actually be too much. And so what you'll see is that the person will hit the ground, and then they'll sort of just crumble. And so effectively there, they, they probably tried to stop themselves. They tried to contract their quads and slow themselves down, but they, they generated too much tension in the muscle. You get that, that reflex inhibition from the Golgi tendon organs, shuts the muscle off, and so then that causes them to fall on the ground. But again, it's a protective reflex because if you uh, contract the muscle too strongly, potentially you could damage the muscle belly or you could damage the tendon. And so uh, the Golgi tendon organs, one of the ways to think about them is, a, is as a governor. So they keep you from, from generating too much tension such that you might actually damage the muscle or the tendon. All right, and then last thing. So I've mentioned this a couple times in class, the idea of once a sprain, always a sprain. So if you've sprained your ankle once, you've probably done it more than once. Um, and so there are obviously a, a number of different reasons why that might occur. Um, but some of that deals with, so if you've, you know, we've talked about the, the connective tissue, we've talked about ligaments, and so obviously this is a, a lateral view of the right ankle. So remember, there's your ATFL, there's your CFL, and then there's your PTFL. Um, and so when you sprain your ankle, you probably stretched out your ATFL. And so because of that, remember that once ligaments are stretched, they stay stretched out. So now you've got some extra movement in that joint that you didn't have, have before. That extra movement is called laxity. So one part of the reason that you sprain your ankle repeatedly is because of that laxity, that looseness, extra motion in the joint. So certainly that's a part of it. Um, but another part of it comes from the altered sensation inside of the joint. So we're less aware of where it is in space. So remember two times ago, we talked about Pacinian corpuscles and Ruffini endings. And so Pacinian corpuscles, both of those two are in the joint capsule. So the joint capsule is not pictured here, but it would obviously be here. Um, and so both Pacinian corpuscles and Ruffini endings are, are sensory fibers inside of the joint capsule. Whenever you sprained your ankle, and those are also in these ligaments, whenever you sprained your ankle, you also damage those corpuscles and Ruffini endings. And so when that happens, um, those were unable then, or after the injury, those aren't able to send sensory feedback back to the brain. So because of the damage to those two uh, sensory structures, we're less aware of where the ankle is in space. So now not only is the ankle a little bit looser, but we've damaged some of the sensory receptors inside of the ankle joint capsule and in the ligaments around the ankle, so we're less aware of where it is in space. Plus, depending upon the intensity of the, of the sprain, you may have also damaged your perineal muscles. So remember, peroneus and uh, longus and brevis, their two tendons are here. So here's peroneus brevis, here's peroneus longus. Remember, those are our two primary everters of the foot, that when we move the foot into inversion, they, uh, because of that stretch, because of the stretch of the muscle spindles, they're going to reflexively contract and pull the foot back into eversion to try to prevent that injury. Um, or try to prevent recurrence of the injury. But again, depending upon the severity of the initial injury, you may have also damaged some of the muscle spindles in your, um, in your perineal muscles. And so because of that, they are also less responsive to that stretch. So when you, you start to invert your ankle again, when you start to put it in a bad position again, um, 
there's a lag time effectively in their reflexive contraction, enabling you to put your foot back into a good position. So the reason you sprained your ankle multiple times is this combination of looseness of the connective tissue as a result of the initial injury, but also decreased perception of where your foot is in space, decreased proprioception because of damage to the Pacinian corpuscles and the Ruffini endings in the ligaments around the ankle and in the joint capsule, and then also potentially damage to the muscle spindles in particularly the everters of the foot. So they're less aware of, of how stretched or not they are, and so they're less good at, at serving a protective function. So if you've sprained your ankle, one of the things that you may have done to try to keep from doing it again is to use an ankle brace or an ankle tape. Uh, and so what those do is they don't usually keep you from doing it again, but they essentially limit the severity. Um, if they do play a role in keeping you from spraining your ankle again, probably the way that they do that is actually by um, activating some of those receptors in the skin. So for example, whenever you, you do the ankle tape job, that's gonna compress the skin. And so by compressing the skin, you're going to then uh, sensitize or activate some of the um, sensory receptors in the skin. So things like your uh, some of the free nerve endings, Meissner's corpuscles, um, the Pacinian corpuscles, also Ruffini endings there as well, because remember those are not only in the joint capsules, but those are also found in various layers of the skin. And so what you can do with that ankle tape job is to basically compress and, and sensitize some of those skin receptors to sort of offset the lack of sensation that you're getting from the ligaments and the capsule in the ankle. Kinesio tape, if you've seen that, um, it's kind of like a spider web looking tape um, that goes, usually if you've seen it, it's probably on somebody's shoulder. Um, so they probably have some shoulder instability issues. And so the idea there is basically the same, uh, serves a similar function. So by providing that extra tactile sensation on the shoulder or on the skin of the shoulder, you get some proprioceptive feedback from the skin that is um, enhanced, that hopefully offsets the reduction in sensation that you're getting from the joint capsules and the muscles around the um, shoulder joint in that case. Plyometric training, just a quick bit about it. Plyometric training is um, where you get a rapid stretch of the muscle followed by a rapid contraction. And so um, what plyometric training does is, is with that rapid stretch, you're able to actually get a stronger contraction than if you just try to voluntarily contract the muscles um, alone. So an example here is if you, um, for the sake of argument, let's pretend that you want to jump as high as you can. So you're going to do a vertical jump test. And so you squat down, hold it, and then voluntarily contract the muscles to try to jump up as high as you can. Probably not going to get all that high. But if you stand up straight, drop into a quick squat, and then immediately jump back up, so rapid stretch, rapid contraction, that's a plyometric action, um, you're going to get a stronger contraction of the musculature. And so what you get there is you take advantage of those muscle spindles, because again, remember that when the muscles are stretched, it excites the muscle spindles, they cause an excitatory response, they cause reflexive involuntary muscle contraction. And so if we combine that involuntary muscle contraction with the voluntary muscle contraction that you're trying to generate anyway, you get increased uh, muscular force production, and so you're able to jump up a little bit higher. So that's how plyometric training works. All right, so that's all I have for you for the peripheral nervous system. So we have one more chapter left. Next week, we'll move on to the autonomic nervous system, and then that's it. So uh, as always, email me if you have any questions, and other than that, uh, we'll talk to you next week.